My dearly beloved in Christ, I would like to just share with you this, this morning some of the details from our recent pilgrimage to Ireland. Now, you know, over the past 20 or so years, I've organized a number of pilgrimages and two years ago was requested by several persons to uh, arrange a pilgrimage to Ireland. And so I agreed that this would be the final one that I've arranged. And there were 16 of us all together that spent 11 days in Ireland visiting various religious sites. And rather than give you a point-by-point -point account of our travels, I would just like to talk in general about some of the places we visited and also about the history of Ireland, which very much ties in with any pilgrim who is going to go there. So, of course, the Christian history of Ireland begins with St. Patrick landing on the island in 432. Now, he actually was not the first missionary there. There was another bishop who had gone there the previous year, but was very discouraged, had no success or little success, and so he left and went to Scotland. St. Patrick was uniquely prepared for this mission of converting the Irish people because, as you know from his story, he was captured at the age of 15 by pirates from Ireland and taken back as a slave. And he spent six years taking care of animals and now being separated from his parents, his family, and the opportunity to go to Mass. Now he began to really pray and to reflect upon the blessings of the faith. In fact, he prayed continuously and did great penance. And after six years, he was miraculously preserved or, or, or released from that, that slavery. And then he kept hearing the voices of the Irish people saying, holy youth, come back to us and teach us about your God and about how to get to heaven. And so he prepared himself, becoming a cleric, studying in the monasteries, <clears throat> eventually went to see the Pope, who was St. Celestine, and was commissioned to go to Ireland, was consecrated a bishop. He went there, as I said, in 432, and he landed in the northern part of Ireland, uh, near a place called Downpatrick, which is where he is buried. And that's where he concluded his missionary travels. And there are two accounts of when he died, but... The more probable, in my opinion, is that he died in 493, which means he spent close to 60 years there in Ireland evangelizing the people, spreading the faith, the length and breadth of the land. Now, St. Patrick began, as I said, in Northern Ireland, converted the local chieftain. But he was very wise. He knew that if he was going to have a successful missionary apostolate there, he would need to get permission from the high king who lived in a place called Tara. So he went to see the high king, but it so happened that when he arrived close to the hill of Tara, it was Holy Saturday. And so according to his custom, he celebrated the resurrection of our Lord that night by building a bonfire. Now, it had been commanded by the Druids, by the high king being told by the Druids, that they were going to have, it so happened to coincide with some pagan holiday, they were going to have a lighting ceremony of a bonfire, and it was commanded that there should be no fire anywhere until the high king lit his fire. And they looked up on the hill of Slain and they saw this fire burning. And one of the Druids prophetically said, unless this fire is extinguished, it will light a conflagration that will spread all over the land and will be our doom, meaning the Druids and the pagan religion, which of course is what happened. So they sent messengers or soldiers to get St. Patrick. He went to see the high king and he didn't convert him, but he impressed him to such a point that he was given permission to travel anywhere throughout Ireland. And that's what he did. He traveled throughout the island and, and again converted it by the time he died basically the entire nation was christian so we visited the hill of slain 
where he built that bonfire, which I think is a significant uh, point for the conversion of the country. And another one is a mountain in Western Ireland uh, called Crowpatrick. And St. Patrick every year for Lent would spend 40 days in fasting and would choose a different place and just spend the entire time in one long retreat. So early on, it was either 433 or 434, he went up this mountain and he spent the entire Lent on top of the mountain, fasting, and earned many graces for his mission. And so to this day, it is a custom people go there and walk up the mountain. It is 2,500 feet high or thereabouts and pretty arduous because of all the stones and the last part is a very steep ascent. I did it 20 years ago, but it was a lot easier than it was this time around. At any rate, of our 16 people, 10 of us made the climb praying our rosaries as we went up the mountain on which St. Patrick spent that Lent. Going to Ireland and wanting to visit the religious sites is different from going, say, to Italy or France or another Catholic country because they have the magnificent uh, basilicas and cathedrals and the shrines of saints. And Ireland is different for several reasons. First of all, the history. Ireland was dominated for more than 700 years by England. And it started with King Henry II, the same English king who was responsible for the death of St. Thomas of Becket. So he took over Ireland as, uh, as far as politically around the year 1170. Now things weren't too bad <clears throat> until the Reformation came around. King Henry VIII in 1541 commanded that all priests had to leave Ireland and all monks or they would be put to death. All of the Catholic churches were taken away and became Anglican. And all of the monasteries were dispersed. And so you go to these sites now and they're ruins because of that. But two of my favorite are called Clonmac Noise, which was founded by St. Kieran, and Glendalough, founded by St. Kevin. Now, again, today they're on ruins, but you still see the high crosses and the towers and the various churches, the ruins of the churches. It, they all, you also see a lot of graves because they become cemeteries. Why? Because the Irish people believe that this is holy ground and they wanted to be buried on these sites where there was a monastery. But in their prime, and this, these were founded in the 500s, so in the 6th century, 7th century, 8th century, there were as many, if you can believe this, as 2,000 monks at each place. They were like a city unto themselves. And not only from all over Ireland, but young men came from mainland Europe to go to Ireland to study in the, uh, in the monasteries there. And the reason why is because of the fall of the Roman Empire. So in the year 476, the Roman Empire finally fell to the barbarians. And subsequent to that, there were various waves of barbarian tribes that swept across Europe, taking the good fertile land, settling down into the valleys and the, the meadows and so forth. And this was, this led to many wars and a lot of destruction because there, were, there weren't just one or two or three waves of tribes that came from the east. It, there were successive waves, one after another, because of the good fertile land. And this led to the complete destruction of learning and schools for the most part. And so that's why many went to uh, Ireland and then later on, Ireland sent missionaries back to Europe. They also preserved in Ireland the scriptures and the various books by copying them. So that's an important part of the history. But as I said now, these monastic sites are in ruins, but they are still uh, wonderful to be able to visit them. We also um, visited in, um, in Dublin, one of my favorite churches is called the Whitefriars Church. They have the relics of St. Valentine in that church. But one thing I like about that church is you always see, every time I've been there, you see people praying the rosary in that church. You see piety. So it's good to see that that is still there. Sadly, however, 
the younger generations, for the most part, have lost their faith, don't even go to church at all. All of this thanks to Vatican II. It really is amazing that Henry VIII, again, as I said, dissolved the monasteries and took over the churches. And then he was followed by his daughter, Elizabeth I, who was even more brutal, suppressing any remnants of Catholicism. And the people preserved the faith. They refused to convert to the new Protestant religion. They held on to their faith. And for two to 300 years, priests were outlawed and they would offer mass in secret locations. They would travel around in hiding. And they have what are called mass rocks. And it's really unique to see these flat rocks on which mass was offered. We did not visit any of them on this trip because you have to hike quite a ways. You have to know where they are and you have to go through different fields and over fences and to find them. It's not that easy, even with a map. So because they're not on the main course, we didn't visit them, although I have in the past. So that's how the faith was preserved for several hundred years until the early 19th century. There was an Irish um, politician who became a minister to parliament in England named Daniel O'Connell, and he obtained some measure of freedom to practice the faith in Ireland. Sadly, however, several decades later, there was what was called the Great Potato Famine. Now, this famine, which as I will explain, really wasn't a famine, led to the death of a million and a half persons. At the time of the famine, there were over eight million people living in Ireland. To this day, there's something like four million living there. Ireland never recovered after the famine because as I said, a million and a half people died and many others emigrated to the United States, Australia, New Zealand, other countries. But the famine was in the latter half of the 1840s. I think it began, they give the dates as 1846 to 1849. And the reason why that was so devastating is because if you were a Catholic, and you refused to convert to Protestantism, you could not own land. And so the land was simply taken away from the Catholics and given to these powerful landlords from England. And they would control large areas and the people who owned the land before would now be tenants on the land working for the landlord. And they were not allowed to have the food they produced. They were given instead a small tract of land and they would grow potatoes because that was a good staple to live on and they were able to produce a large amount on a small tract of land. But then when the potato blight came, people no longer had that food. And what was ironic is they were producing on the landlord's land, they were producing grain, all kinds of vegetables and fruits and dairy products and meat, but that all went back to England they weren't allowed to have it, even though they produced it, because they had to live on what they produced on their little plot of land, which was primarily potatoes. So it was a devastating thing, and as our bus driver made the comment, he says he refused to call it, refuses to call it the Great Famine, they call it instead the Great Hunger, because a famine is when you're starving because there is no food. There was plenty of food. The Irish people just weren't allowed to have it because of their refusal to convert to Protestantism. He even referred to it as a genocide. So that's a sad page of history. We went to a famine museum because I wanted those on the pilgrimage to see and to learn that uh, page of history, that fact. Um, this led, again, to many Irish emigrating to the United States. And of course, Ireland was so strong in the faith, they had so many vocations, they had too many priests. They, they couldn't even support the number of priests, so many priests came. And in this country, the majority of the clergy, the early years of the United States, were from Ireland. Sadly, today, there are very few vocations left. You see the devastation, what Vatican II has brought, brought about in several decades, that several hundred years of Protestantism was not able to eradicate the faith. But Vatican II has done it, for the most part. A couple of highlights for me were going to pray before the tombs of Matt Talbot 
and uh, Father John Sullivan, and also Blessed Oliver Plunkett. Blessed Oliver Plunkett was a bishop who was martyred in 1681 for no other crime than being a Catholic and functioning as a priest and a bishop in Ireland. Um, his relics are in a, the town of Drowada, which is just a little north of Dublin. But you don't go to many shrines of saints for several reasons. First of all, if you go through the litany of the saints of Ireland, most of them lived 13, 14, 1500 years ago. And with many of them, they know basically where they're buried, but don't know the exact spot of their grave. And part of the reason of that was because the Protestants tried to eliminate any possibility of pilgrims going to the shrines, uh, going to the tombs of the saints. And so with these many saints, you don't have the tombs. But as I mentioned, two holy men, uh, Matt Talbot lived, uh, I think he was born in 1860 or thereabouts. He died in 1925. And he was a simple laborer never married, lived with his mother, but sadly, he had a terrible addiction to alcohol. And for some 10 to 15 years, he was a hopeless alcoholic. He would spend whatever he earned at his job on alcohol. And finally, one day, by the grace of God, he determined that he was going to reform his life. And he walked into the house and he said to his mother, I'm going to take the pledge. Now, the pledge is something that was preached by a holy Dominican priest named Father Matthew. People take the pledge to swear off alcohol completely. If they were not able to make use of it in a moderate way, just to give it up completely. And he was quite successful. Tens of thousands would come out to hear the lectures in the 19th century of Father Matthew and took the pledge. So Matt said to his mother, I'm going to take the pledge. And she said to him very wisely, she said, don't take it unless you intend to keep it. So he took the pledge for one month. It was torture for him. But then he persevered. And after that month, he took it for a year. And then he took it for life. Matt Talbot is an amazing man. I've read several different books on his life. He would go to three masses every morning. He did tremendous penance. He was praying continuously, a very quiet man. He went to his job and just kept to himself. And then when he get home, he'd go up in his room and kneel down right away and start praying. And he would pray for hours on his knees. He slept very little at night, but he slept on a board with a block of wood for his pillow. And that was his, that's what he slept on. As I said, he did tremendous penance and also prayer. So in my mind, he's certainly a saintly man, although he's not been canonized. And as I said, he died in 1925. So we went to the church that has his mortal remains, as well as chains that he wore around his waist. He was a slave of our Blessed Mother. And then we went to another church that had other artifacts that he used, the bed and different things uh, that he used. The other man whose tomb I wanted to visit in Dublin was a priest, Father John Sullivan, who died in 1933, a Jesuit priest who worked many miracles. In fact, I had never heard of him till one of my parishioners in Boston gave me a book on his life, and I was fascinated by the holiness of this man who, again, in my mind, is truly a, was truly a saintly man. So those were a couple of um, uh, places that we visited that were significant to me. And one last point that I would make that was very interesting, is probably three or more, four months ago, before I left on this trip, I began to get emails from traditional Catholics in Ireland who wanted to know our itinerary because they wanted to go to Mass. And uh, I asked some of these people, how did you even find out about this? Well, again, it's through the internet, through forums or blogs or, you know, communication of traditional Catholics. Matter of fact, I went to one woman's home, had mass in her home, and she said, say hello to so-and-so. I know he's going into your seminary this year. And I was like, how do you even know him? And she's been communicating with this young man in the United States. And so uh, it's wonderful to see that, that there are traditional Catholics there and that the faith is reviving. There is a priest from France who goes to Ireland on occasion and has three mass centers, but there's no traditional Catholic priest that lives in Ireland. So I hope and pray that it will, um, that the faith will grow. Some people said to me, 
Well, I know about you from your sermons. So people listen to sermons on the internet, they read the different websites, and it's wonderful that the internet can be used as a means of spreading the faith nowadays. So we met some of the traditional Catholics there. Unfortunately, others were not able to come because our schedule was such that it was kind of a rigid schedule. I hope one day to be able to go back and have mass for those people and visit them in their homes. So that pretty much is a, a summary of our trip. And uh, next Sunday in the bulletin, I'll put a website or two that so there are some pictures up on the uh, on blogs or up on the internet that if you want to see pictures from our uh, pilgrimage to Ireland. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.